Okay, Janice, we're going to have a little chat about the systems. Mm -hmm. So to start off with, the respiratory system, just go through an overview of how it works. So the horses breathe through their nose, um, the air goes in the nasal passages and down the trachea. Um. Our discussion in the anatomy and physiology part of the assessment covers the respiratory system, cardiovascular system and the anatomy of the lower leg and foot. We expect a clear understanding of how the respiratory system is made up and the functions of each part, such as the take up of oxygen and flushing out of carbon dioxide, and likewise with the cardiovascular system. The heart sits in the middle of the chest, it pumps oxygenated blood out through the arteries. With reference to how the blood circulates oxygen and nutrients and removes waste with the help of the lymphatic system. We're just going to have a look at the structure of the lower leg, which is okay. quite important that we're aware of that. So just show me some of the main parts of the lower leg. So anywhere below the knee, what you um. might expect to find and where they are. In describing the anatomy of the lower leg and foot, we expect a good grasp of the bones, ligaments and tendons. Sesamoid bones. Mm -hmm. So we've got the flexor tendons at the back, we've got the superficial flexor tendon, then the deep digital. Moving on to horse health, Janice, we've got quite a lot to talk about here. <laughs> so the first thing that we're going to discuss is what sort of records you keep for your horse and what would be on them and how would you do it? Um, so all the horses at our yard have an individual health record. We keep a record of when they're due their vaccinations, um, when they've had them. It's also in their passport as well. We'll expect a good understanding of the basics of managing a horse's health from health records and biosecurity to the symptoms and management of common health conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, their individual TPR rates as well, so we, we do that um, so we know the normal okay. base that rates for them. That leads us beautifully <laughs> on to TPR. So we're actually going to take this horse's TPR. Okay. So the equipment's outside. If you'd like to go and select what you need, okay. and then we'll come back and do it. Okay. Okay, okay. got what you need? I think so, yes. Okay, so TPR, what are we going to do first? I'm going to start with the respiration rate um, while he's nice and relaxed. If I can come yep. back here. I'm just going to watch his flank, sort of watch it move in and out. Mm -hmm. um, and every sort of complete in and out is one breath. And I do that for about 30 seconds and then multiply it by two to get the, the breaths per minute. Next, I'm going to um, take the pulse rate. Mm -hmm. So I've got the stethoscope. So, so ideally, you I want would to like be to on the other, the other side, side. yeah. Let's move on to the temperature because that's obviously really important that we can take a horse's temperature. Okay. So just talk me through that. Um, so I'd use a digital thermometer. In the assessment, you won't actually be asked to take a horse's temperature, but a groom should know how to do this. Touching the side of the wall, make sure I hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And again, what would you expect the horse's temperature to be? Between 37 to 38 degrees. Our discussion will also review the roles of other healthcare professionals that a vet may make referral to, such as an equine dental technician, physiotherapists and chiropractors. Okay Janice, what sort of common health conditions can we find in the horse? Uh, colic's quite a common one. Mm -hmm. There's ringworm or uh, laminitis. Okay, let's stick with colic because okay. that's quite a good one to talk about. Just tell me what it is. It's essentially uh, stomach pain in the horse mm -hmm. um, or any sort of abdominal pain in the horse. Mm -hmm. um, it can be quite serious because they, um, they can't be sick so anything that goes through their system has to go all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be life threatening for the horse as well. Sometimes they might need an operation or they definitely need to see mm -hmm. the vet. So. Okay, so what are the signs that a horse might have colic? We'll expect this discussion to detail at least five common health conditions. Besides colic, these could include tendon and ligament injuries, bony enlargements, ringworm, azoteria, lymphangitis, strangles, equine influenza, and chronic pulmonary disease. We want to check the groom has the knowledge to quickly and correctly assess the condition in the early stages, clearly describe the symptoms and devise an appropriate plan of action. A moment ago, you mentioned about ringworm mm -hmm. and the symptoms of ringworm. What would you do if you suspected that the horse did have ringworm? Um, if I thought he had ringworm, I'd get the vet to confirm it first of all. Mm -hmm. um, then I'd want to keep him in isolation. This is a good example of how a discussion can move from one topic to another at an opportune moment. 
The initial question was focused on describing and managing common health problems, but the follow-up raised another key topic in biosecurity. It's important to remain alert to this, as many things we will discuss during the assessment are interconnected. We don't necessarily follow a set order, and we may pick up on something that you were expecting to come later. OK, Janice, we're now going to talk a little bit about quality of life. Not always the easiest subject to talk about for a lot of horse owners, I know. Mm -hmm. But what sort of things could we use to assess the quality of life for horses, particularly those perhaps in their latter days? Uh, no, it's not easy, but I think you've got to think about the welfare of the horse. Absolutely. And think about what he, he's able to do, whether mm -hmm. he's able to get up and down comfortably, mm -hmm. and if he's able to eat, if he's holding his weight and able yeah. to move around the field and sort of interact with the other horses. Although it's an emotional subject, we'd expect the groom to talk knowledgeably about the quality of life principles, humane euthanasia and the people who can carry it out legally, and the options for carcass removal. Mention could also be made of the information on quality of life and euthanasia on the BHS website and the support available through Friends at the End. OK, so stereotypical behaviours, Janice, what do we mean by those? Um, it's a bit of a coping mechanism for the horse um, or it can be a display of anxiety um, in a stressful situation. So if horses have been turned out or has been left by his, himself or um, perhaps if he's been stabled for a long time and he's just bored or possibly hungry if he's not had hay for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way of them sort of dealing with that and, and coping with it. And how might they show that? Um, they tend to be repetitive actions, so it could be weaving, um, especially if the friends have gone out and he's left in the stable, mm -hmm. he can't follow them. So you'll see him over the stable door swinging his head and neck mm -hmm. from side to side as they sort of shift the weight in their front legs from one to the other. Um, and then there's crib biting as well, so where they take hold of the top of the door or any fixed object really, and they gulp air. We'll expect a good knowledge of the signs and causes of stereotypic behaviour such as reviewing the horse's routine, workload, feeding, handling and access to open space. We'll also expect the groom to know how to manage horses that are difficult to handle and be prepared to discuss things such as methods of restraint, loading, treating wounds, clipping and catching a horse. OK, so Janice, just briefly talk me through how we're going to maintain a paddock. Um, so from day to day or week to week, you want to remove the droppings, um, keep an eye out for any poisonous plants and remove them, and keep an eye on how many weeds are growing and try and cut them back. Okay. We'd expect a good grasp of what it takes to keep a paddock in good condition. This ranges from annual maintenance tasks such as weed control, rolling, harrowing, topping and fertilising, to practices such as rotational grazing and cross grazing and how these benefit the paddock. We'd also expect the groom to know that this work would be done by a contractor if the yard didn't have the necessary machinery. OK, so Janice, what are we looking for in this horse's confirmation? Um, so the overall picture, first of all, whether the horse is in proportion. Mm -hmm. Another important skill for a groom is the ability to analyse a horse's static and dynamic confirmation. We'll observe and discuss the conformation of a horse. This will include reference to the feet, hooves, pastern angles, breed, type, as well as analysis of gait and general movement. We'll also expect an overview of the shape and composition of the horse, its condition, type, and the kind of work it would be best suited to. Okay, Laura, I'd like you to walk him straight up for me turn at the top, walk straight down, and then we're going to do the same thing in trot. So if you turn and walk first and then trot in a straight line, walk, turn around and then trot back. Okay. Okay, Janice, so what are you looking for? So first of all, I'm looking for how he's moving his limbs, whether he moves in a straight line, mm -hmm. um, whether they land straight, um, whether the hind legs are following the, the track of the front legs. Mm -hmm. This question can come at any time during the assessment, but often it's a natural follow-on when observing the horse trotting up. The response should consider the horse at rest, in walk and trot. OK, Laura, trot. So the same in the trot, we're looking that he takes Ooh. even strides. It doesn't look quite right there. 
So he doesn't look quite sound, so he does looked, he? Yeah, he took a shorter stride on the turn. Thank you. Uh huh. So potentially um, you're saying this horse could be lame. Yeah, yeah. I want to look at him again, probably. Um, and what indicated that? Um, so in front, if they're sort of nodding their head, if they're lame in front, they would lift their head up as the, the lame leg touched the ground to try and take the weight off it and then drop their head down as the sound leg came to the ground. Mm -hmm. And then behind, they would drop the hip on the side that they're um, lame on. Okay. Okay, Janice, we've got a variety of shoes on the table here. So let me pick one. I'm just going to pick this shoe here. And if you could just tell me a little bit about it. Okay. It looks like a bar shoe. It's, it's got the heels joined together here. Mm -hmm. um. We'll expect a good knowledge of the different types of shoes. Our discussion could range from design features such as concave, fullered, toe and quarter clips, to remedial shoes, pads and glue-on shoes. Any other shoe and you can talk to me about one of okay. those. Take this one. Mm -hmm. um, this is quite a light shoe. I think it's a racing shoe. Mm -hmm. um, they're not made of, of steel like the other ones. They're made of, um, I think it's aluminium, uh -huh. which makes them quite light. Um, so when the horse is racing, they, so they don't have the extra weight of a, a shoe as well to take. Yes. Um, they tend to put them on for, for just maybe the day of the race or maybe a few days before and after because, they, because they're quite light. They're not very hard wearing, so they don't last yeah. very long. Okay.